Okay, so this is chapter 20. We're going to be looking at cancer. So, um, so first of all, we'll start ourselves off with a bit of an overview. The important thing about cancer to understand is that cancer is um, in its inception is fairly simple. It's essentially uncontrolled cell growth. Um, and so generally speaking, when you get uh, cancer, it's usually because cells are growing without control and regulation and they begin to accumulate the number of cells, but they also will accumulate mutations, which ultimately leads to even more loss of control of the cell cycle, which leads to more accumulation of mutations, which leads to more loss of control. And so it just becomes a feeding kind of a downward spiral. Now, one of the important things uh, to understand is that usually when a cancer cell our cell becomes cancerous they lack what's called differentiation and so what differentiation is is essentially this is the process there's a lot of different cues that goes into this where a cell will acquire a very specific identity and that identity is wrapped around its structure and its function a good example would be say for instance a just sort of a generic garden variety cell that eventually differentiates into something very highly specialized like a neuron. And so they will not specialize in any one thing. And so as a result, they're not functional. They don't really do anything. So they're basically like a lot of sort of premature, sort of undeveloped cells. And uh, because they're not differentiated like other cells, they oftentimes will take on a very distinct abnormal look. And so um, one of those abnormalities that you see is in the nucleus. So for instance, a cancerous nuclei will oftentimes be larger than the normal nucleus. And it can have lots of chromosomes, like an abnormal number of chromosomes. So too many, basically. And then uh, these chromosomes will oftentimes harbor mutations. And some of those mutations are lethal and some of those mutations will provide benefits. Normally, when a cell starts to acquire a lot of DNA damage by way of mutation or um, chromosome abnormalities, it's designed to go through a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And so that's how you kind of get rid of the bad cells, so to speak, so that all that's left over are good cells. But cancers don't do that. So basically what cancers do is they acquire mutations that help them to evade apoptosis. And so a lot of times then when you're dividing, and especially for cells that divide frequently, they have a more greater likelihood of becoming cancerous because they're in the cell division process. If they kind of get it wrong or they go off the rails, then they can start to evade the normal cell control. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So here is... Um, the kind of the change in the nuclei of a cell. So here you can see a normal nucleus of a cell. Then as they start to change, you can see they start to create these sort of abnormal amorphous um, looks. And then you can see they start to get these gigantic nuclei, which are clearly outliers to say, for instance, a normal cell, which should look something a little bit more like this. These are skin cells. And so it should look something more like what I have in the red box but you can see the nuclei are clearly not like any other nuclei. Okay, so ultimately um, a cancer cell, unlike normal cells, basically have an unlimited replication potential. That is to say that oftentimes they're immortal. They just keep on dividing. Um, and so the ends of the chromosomes, which have telomeres, um, have repetitive DNA sequences on them. Those are the telomeres are like little pieces of reed, like little adapters that extend the length of the chromosome. In a normal cell, the telomeres get shorter because of the mechanism of replication um, after every single cell division. And as a matter of fact, we have an enzyme called telomerase whose job it is to extend the ends of the chromosomes. But telomerase is highly controlled. In cancer cells, they basically um, extend their telomeres um, at a very, very long. Um, so like when they shorten their telomeres, they don't just keep shortening and shortening. They basically continue to lengthen them 
this allows them to keep dividing over and over without ever actually um, losing any DNA complement. Think of the telomere as sort of like a little bit of a clock. It's sort of uh, designed to give you a certain finite number of, repli of, of replications of uh, cell divisions. And when you run out of telomere, you're done. As a cell, that's your life expectancy. That's your cell senescence. But what, tel what cancer cells have done is they've figured out a way to extend those telomeres indefinitely so that they could just keep on dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing. And they don't ever, they don't ever um, adhere to that shelf life idea. And so that kind of makes them immortal. So basically they can divide in an unlimited capacity. So telomerase, like I mentioned before in the previous slide, is the enzyme whose job it is to build the telomeres out. And so those that's a normal enzyme. And so the telomerase will give a normal cell a very specific um, shelf life. Like for instance, if you need to divide a certain number of times, but you have to divide more than your normal telomere will allow you to do, then you can use telomerase to extend um, out your number of divisions so that you can do your job. But telomerase is usually under tight, tight control. So cancer cells will basically use telomerase to essentially indefinitely extend that end, just like I mentioned before in the previous slide. So ultimately, once you get this out of control division and this immortality, basically you have an immortal cell with lots of DNA damage in it, lots of chromosomal damage in it, too many chromosomes, all of which, by the way, should be signals for the cell to go through apoptosis. That's programmed cell death. But instead, the cancer cells have evaded that normal signal, so they live forever, and they can divide forever because of the telomerase. And if they divide forever with all these mutations, then they start to pile up and they start to create tumors, which are essentially piles of these uncontrolled growing cells. Normally, a cell will experience what's called contact inhibition. Basically, this is where cells stop dividing when they bump into a neighbor. And that kind of makes them stop. So like, for instance, if I have a cell that's growing and it divides and it bumps into a neighbor, then basically they feel each other and then they stop. What a cancer cell does, however, is it doesn't feel that, that signal. It basically, what it does is it basically starts to pile up and that's a loss of contact inhibition. And when it piles up, it doesn't realize that it should have stopped a while ago. And then ultimately you start to get this mass, this tumor, this tumorous mass. So cancer cells don't have that sense of contact inhibition. They also will disregard growth factors. Remember, growth factors basically are the hormones, usually, that are telling that tell cells to divide. So this is your control. This is your regulatory voice. This is the boss instructions, telling the cell to do what it needs to do. And generally speaking, you have two different types of growth factors, one that will stimulate and one that will inhibit cell cycle. Cancer cells, however, they keep on dividing and they ignore um, and they stop listening to the cell cycle control. They stop listening to your growth factors. And it's your growth factors, basically, that helps regulate your cells and keeps your cells from kind of running out ahead and building up too much. Like for instance, uh, every dividing cell population in your body, like your skin cells, for instance, which are constantly replacing your skin as you slough it off is under the control of a growth factor. In this particular case, it's epidermal growth factor. So if epidermal growth factor basically becomes uh, too aggressive, then you'll get these large pileups of skin material all over your skin. Um, if you cut off epidermal growth factor, then your skin will just stop growing. So your growth factors are in control of basically the cells, how they grow, when they grow, and, and why they grow. But cancer cells are ignoring those instructions. So ultimately, when a cell becomes mutated and it escapes cell cycle control, it doesn't become cancerous overnight. There's a process to this. So the cancer cell will basically become abnormal, but it'll be a gradual process. 
And so initially um, that kind of slippery slope, like once you kind of have a problem can uh, sell, there's kind of like a slow increase to cancer. And then it starts to increase exponentially. And usually somewhere in this exponential curve is where we usually detect it in our body. The term carcinogenesis is basically referring to the creation and the development of cancer in its multi-stage process. And there's three broad stages within which we have other sub-stages that we usually fit in there. First of all, initiation is where your cell mutates, becomes a problem, and it begins to divide repeated, repeatedly. So basically, it's not cancer yet. But it's, you know, it's kind of watch out, right? So that's kind of what, what it is. So it's escaped cell cycle control. That's the first step. Now, this particular phase may linger for some time, and it depends. The next major leap in the development of the cancer is tumor development. That's promotion. And so here you start to get abnormal cell growth. Those cells start to lose contact inhibition. They start to pile up. They start to create tumor cells which continue to divide and they tend to accumulate more mutations. So basically what the cancer cell is doing is rotating through all these mutations, hoping to get a mutation that's beneficial for its progression. And it'll pick up a mutation oftentimes randomly. And one of those might basically allow it to progress to the next stage. And that's progression. This is where one cell gains the ability that's by mutation because remember, you're just basically cycling through all these mutations, just randomly trying to pick which one is good. And you come by a mutation that will give you the ability to invade surrounding tissues, and that's progression. And this is kind of what it looks like. So ultimately, you start off with one cell in an otherwise normal sheet of epithelial cells. That becomes a problem. Then what this one cell will do is start to divide without control, so you have basically repeated cell division, and then it's going to start to create a lineage of cells that begins to sort of push the normal cells away. And one of these cells may have picked up an extra mutation, and that extra mutation may have given it new ability. And that's important. That's how cancer cells progress. They basically rotate through. They kind of just randomly um just by dumb luck, just try to sort through all these mutations and they hope they pick up a, a good one. And maybe that second mutation gives it the ability to avoid contact inhibition. And now all of a sudden you've got a pile up of cells. But then one of those cells will pick up a third mutation and maybe that third mutation will give it a new ability. And that new ability is invasion. So now all of a sudden, it's not minding this bottom barrier that typically hems in the epithelial tissue. Now what's gonna happen is it's gonna to start to divide, invade now into the surrounding tissues. And then over here, we have a blood vessel. That's the blood vessel, and this is a lymphatic vessel. So during invasion, when those cells basically invade, they can enter into the lymphatic system. And at that point, they become um, malignant. And if they get into the bloodstream, they become malignant. Actually, they're already malignant. So once they actually get into the, the bloodstream, they can break off and move throughout the body. This is actually a type of malignancy called metastasis. We actually break off and start spreading to the rest of the body. So this new metastatic tumor then can lodge somewhere else in the body that's not affected by cancer. And it can basically start to regrow cancer and then reinvade more vessels. And that's basically how tumors progress. But it has to basically go through and pick up beneficial mutations. So one of those beneficial abilities that it picks up is something called angiogenesis. So the larger a tumor gets, the, these are still cells. And these cells need to have nutrients and they need to have oxygen. The problem is if you don't have access to the blood supply, then you're only going to, you're going to be limited in how big you can grow. That is to say cells cannot outgrow their supply. That's also true for tumors. 
So if a tumor starts to grow too big where the cells on the periphery get too far away from their blood supply, then they're just going to die. And that'll keep your tumor at a modest size because you can't, you're limited in how big you can grow because you can't supply enough nutrients to all those cells. However, one of the common mutations that tumors will pick up is um, an angiogenic um, mutation. This is a mutation that will start turning on genes that are normally involved in the development of new blood vessels. This is a process called angiogenesis. So when the tumor finds those genes and mutates them and turns them on, then the tumor will be able to make its own blood vessels. And that's angiogenesis. Now, all of a sudden, it removes the limitation on size. So you can get as big as you want. And then after that, as you start to move into um, surrounding tissue, you have to cross the bottom portion. We talked about this in the tissues chapter, where you have an epithelial layer on top of a basement membrane. That basement membrane is keeping these tumorous cells from crossing into the connective tissue. But if you pick up a mutation that allows you to break through that basement membrane, then you can invade the blood in the lymphatic vessel and then you can spread throughout the rest of the body and basically create a new tumor. So ultimately, cancer is a mutation of a cell cycle gene that begins to snowball with multiple mutations that makes it more beneficial and removes all the normal checks and controls on cell cycle. Normally cell cycle is regulated by what's called checkpoints. Generally speaking, as you go through cell cycle, those phases we talked about in the last chapter, you have proteins like cyclin, which is essentially what allows the cell to move from one cycle to the next. So for instance, you have different cyclins that are queuing the cell up to go through G1, S, G2, and M phase. And generally speaking, you have checkpoints in each one of these different phases. And at these checkpoints, typically specific things like for instance, DNA damage and things like that are being worked on. And these checkpoint proteins are making sure that everything is okay. So this basically, they're designed to ensure a healthy cell. Now, what happens if you don't have a healthy cell? Then basically you go through apoptosis. So normally, when you take a look at a cancer cell, if you did make a mutation in these checkpoint proteins, then the, the cell will not stop at this checkpoint and won't be able to go through its quality control checkdowns. So you'll lose control of the cell cycle and you'll basically result in cancer and it will result in the accumulation of DNA damage and mutations. There are two types of um, checkpoint proteins that we see. One is called proto-oncogenes. Uh, these are genes that are normal initially, but these are um, typically genes that encode for a protein and they will actually promote cell cycle and they're normal, right? Um, and they'll prevent apoptosis. So these are normal and less mutated. That's why they're called proto-oncogenes. Now, a tumor suppressor gene encodes for a protein that will inhibit the cell cycle. And so it tends to promote apoptosis. So this is basically a regulator. If you want to think of it in terms of on-off switches, proto-oncogenes will turn on the cell cycle. So that's like your on switch. And tumor suppressor genes will turn off the cell cycle or keep it from moving forward. And so these become important regulatory types of uh, proteins. Now, when the proto-oncogene will mutate, typically they will essentially be a stimulating cell cycle without control. And then once they become mutated and they no longer turned off, they're no longer kept quiet, then they become what's called oncogenes. And those will be basically, these are cancer-causing genes. So this is a cancer-causing 
Now, for every proto oncogene, we have two copies, one coming from mom and one coming from dad. Only one of these uh, need to be mutated in order to lose control. This is what we refer to as a dominant negative type of situation. Only one mutation will get us uh, to an oncogene state. Proto-oncogenes, however, um, will oftentimes uh, encode uh, growth factors um, um, and uh, receptor proteins, things like that. So basically, if these are stuck on, right, in the on state, then there's um, unregulated cell growth. It's like a it's like a perpetual green light, an unregulated green light for cell growth. So these become very, very easy to activate. And this is kind of what it looks like, right? So basically here's your normal situation. So you have a growth factor that comes in. So here's your growth factor. It'll bind to a receptor on a target cell. And that'll trigger a signaling pathway that will ultimately communicate and go into the nucleus and communicate a transcription factor whose job it is to basically stimulate um, the cell cycle genes, right? And the cell cycle genes will turn on and they'll make a protein that uh, stimulates the cell cycle um, and then that'll turn cell cycle on. And so that's the normal process of a proto-oncogene. But then if you were to if you were to mutate one of these, like for instance, if all of a sudden there's a mutation in this receptor that causes it to be stuck on, then it's gonna be sending perpetual signal regardless of what the stimulating growth factor is telling you. And that's gonna be a, a cell that's constantly dividing. So there's several proto-oncogenes um, that are in these signaling pathways. By the way, any of these but will be the uh, sources for uh, proto-oncogenes. So if they get stuck on, they could easily turn into oncogenes. So there's any kind of a, of a mutation in any one of these genes could create an oncogenic type of situation. And so uh, one of the things we've uh, found is that a lot of these proto-oncogenes will call, uh, code for a protein called RAS. And RAS basically is a protein that promotes mitosis and it activates cyclin, which remember is in control of the cell cycle. And so in a lot of different types of cancer, we'll find these RAS oncogenes having been activated is a very common strategy for cancers is to activate this RAS situation. And so cyclin D is another proto-oncogene that will code for cyclin. Um, and that basically means the cyclin's readily available all the time. Now, the important thing about cyclin is cyclin is a protein that uh, normally will build up. So like, for instance, if you have your cell cycle, G1, S, G2, M, and cytokinesis, what will happen is in normal cyclins is the cyclin will increase in the cycle that it's designed to turn on. And then after that cycle is finished at your checkpoint, it'll basically decrease and then it'll wait for the next round of cell cycle. And then it'll increase again, do its job, and then it'll disappear, it'll be broken down. So what we're saying here is the cyclin D, instead of having the cyclic nature, basically is constantly active, which essentially maintains constant cell cycle. So it's like you never exit that phase of the cell cycle, and that becomes a problem. So tumor suppressor genes are um, typically, um, usually will lose their inhibition on cell cycle. So these guys remember are keeping the cell cycle off. And so unlike proto-oncogenes, in a tumor suppressor gene, you need both copies to be mutated before you lose control. This is what's referred to as a recessive where both copies that you get, one from mom and one from dad, have to be mutated. And so one of the early um, tumor suppressors, we've found several of them. Uh, the one tumor suppressor that we see here is called BAX. Um, and so BAX is a protein that promotes apoptosis. Remember, this is basically cell death or abnormal cells. So this is a good thing. BAX is a good thing. <laughs> 
But when you mutate backs, then you're not going to do this cell death anymore. And this basically allows abnormal cells to persist. And that's bad. So you remove the ability to keep these cells um, out of circulation. So here's how it looks. So then you have an inhibiting growth factor that comes in, binds to your receptor. Again, this is going to signal a signaling pathway, the final message of which is to come and form a transcription factor, which will turn on um, cell cycle inhibiting structures. So this basically is a protein that's turned on, it's made, it goes out into the cell. Um, and then ultimately what's going to happen is it'll, um, it'll make this protein to inhibit the cell cycle or promote apoptosis. Now, um, if you mutate this transcription factor, um, then all of a sudden this protein is going to be able to be made um, without bound, right? So basically what's happening is you remove the inhibitor. That's what's happening here. If you remove the inhibitor, then the cell will be able to make the protein that it wants. Or if you remove the inhibitor, then it'll allow the cell to be able to avoid apoptosis and to survive into the next generation and then to propagate its bad DNA. So one of the tumor suppressor genes that's of, of notable import is P53. Uh, so-called because of its original designation during research, it was a protein of 53 kilodaltons. P53 has a couple of major activities associated with it. So one is it'll do DNA repair. The second one is it'll actually stimulate cells to go through apoptosis. And the third one is itself is a transcription factor, which will actually turn on other cell division genes. So this is a really, really important tumor suppressor gene. And so it often is really important in activating DNA repair. Now, generally speaking, what will happen is P53 will stop the cell cycle, stimulate DNA repair. If the DNA cannot be repaired, then what P53 does is basically tells the cell to then go into apoptosis and to die. Um, and so that's normally what happens. Many tumors, like nearly 50% of the cancers that we see are actually um, have mutated P53. This is a strategy for cancers. Basically, you take the adult, the supervision out of the room. I always like to think of tumor suppressors and oncogenes as sort of like uh, watching over a room full of, of bad toddlers, right? And so you have a toddler who wants to do badness, but the problem is there's an adult in the room keeping them from doing it. And there's two different strategies you can make uh, to do badness. The first one is like the proto-oncogene. You can just mutate and do it regardless of what the adult is telling you. Um, and that would be like the, pro the, the, the proto-oncogene strategy. However, the P53 strategy, the tumor suppressor strategy would be kind of like if you wanted to do badness, then one of the things you want to do is remove the voice that's telling you no. So if you take out the adult in the room, then you'll be free to do whatever you want. And that's what a lot of cancers do. P53 is the adult in the room telling the toddler, no, stop slapping your sister. And then in this case, cancers will take the P53 out of the room so that they're free to do whatever they wish. And that's a common strategy. For instance, uh, one of um, the tumor suppressors that we see, it's actually not a controller like P53 is, it's actually a repair enzyme, is BRCA1 of breast cancer fame. So this is actually a repair, um, a repair gene and then oftentimes if you have a mutation in this gene, it tends to increase your frequency and your likelihood for breast cancer. And so these typical genes, um, if you have a mutation in them, will disable your body from being able to recognize damaged DNA and they'll progress through the cell cycle and begin to accumulate. So you can either take P53 out of commission, that way nobody can tell you what to do,
or you can actually mutate the repair enzymes. And that's another strategy that we see amongst cancer as well, as they oftentimes will go after repair enzymes and mutate those. So oncology then is basically the study of cancer and an oncologist is a doctor who basically works with cancer. And so um, the prognosis, that is to say what the likely outcome basically will um, depend on a couple of things. Most of them is how quickly did you catch it? For instance, has the tumor invaded surrounding tissues, right? That's malignancy. Um, has it become metastatic? That basically means it's spread through one of your vascular systems to distant parts of the body. Both of those are negative. They will negatively impact your prognosis. And so when we take a look at the classification of tumors, we oftentimes will classify them according to where they originated. Uh, for instance, carcinomas are generally cancers of epithelial tissues, skin cancer, breast tissue, liver tissue, pancreas tissue. Remember, it's epithelial tissue that is basically both the liner tissues and glandular tissues. So those are all the carcinomas. Sarcomas basically are associated with the muscle. Actually, sarco is the root for muscle, and it's also the connective tissues. So this is basically going after bone and fibrous connective tissue and things of that nature. So those are sarcomas. Generally speaking, um, pretty bad, you know, a lot worse than carcinomas. So you can also um, extend this list because we don't just have those two different areas. We also have blood cancers, which we refer to as leukemias, um, cancers of your lymphoid tissue, your lymph system, that's lymphomas, um, the cancer of immature cells. So like you have uh, developmental cells, blast cells that could kind of fall off the rails instead of, um, so these would be like stem cells stem cell abnormalities, that would be blastomas. Um, and so that's kind of how you would basically classify a lot of those. Now, some of the common cancers that we'll see um, is lung cancer, right? Which is the most common that affects the respiratory system. It's greatly exacerbated by smoking. It's probably one of the worst things you can do for your health is to smoke. Um, and this really, really increases not just your uh, risk for lung cancer, but also for um, mouth and throat cancer, which are also very bad. Uh, another common one is colon cancer, colorectal cancer. Um, and this is typically um, associated with different um, cancers along your gastrointestinal tract. So different types of pancreas, uh, different types of, excuse me, um, digestive system cancers like pancreatic cancer, stomach cancer, esophagus cancer. By the way, these are really, really, really nasty. So the, what we have here on the list are, are uh, prognosis wise are grim. These are very grim outcomes. Um, you typically don't last very long if you've got one of these forms of cancer. So the cardiovascular cancers, we typically have uh, mostly we hear of leukemias, some plasma cell tumors, things like that. Of the lymphatic systems, it's uh, Hodgkin's disease. Uh, which is a lymphoma, either Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, basically. Um, uh, Hodgkin's is associated with mutated B-cell lineages. Those are your immune cells that are kind of going off the rails. And then non-Hodgkin's, um, it can be either B or T. Um, thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine system cancer that we see. Um, and that's a usually fairly easy one to deal with because you can always remove the thyroid and you can kind of manage it from there. Um, of the reproductive ones, uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, those are probably the most common ones. We also have uh, in here a lot about uh, cervical cancer, testicular cancer, um, less so the ovaries and the penis. Um, in the urinary system, uh, bladder and kidney cancer, those are typically rare, but they're pretty obnoxious. Um, they're pretty bad. And then of course in skin, melanoma is a really bad one. Um, and basal and squamous cell carcinomas. So those are gonna be epithelial in nature. So melanoma is the real big one. And that's actually one of the hard ones here for Colorado because Colorado always makes the top five in the country for frequency and risk of melanoma because of our altitude and our outdoor lifestyle, constant exposure to UV radiation. So let's go ahead and take a look at mortality figures. 
<clears throat> so this is basically going to be looking by year the rate per 100,000 in terms of the male population, the female population. So you have the different types of cancers in different um, colors. So you can see um, for males, lung cancer um, is very high. Liver cancer is fairly low. Leukemia is fairly low. Um, pancreatic cancer is fairly low. Um, the other main one is colon cancer and prostate cancer for men. So basically these curves right here, it looks like there's a peak of lung cancer that started uh, that started pretty much from the 50s. It increased up into the 90s and now is decreasing as we head forward. Probably this is the latent outcome of a very strong smoking culture post-World War II. In females, you can see it's a little less. So basically smoking was um, not quite as aggressive in females as it was in males. So lung cancer um, is a little bit lower. Uh, breast cancer is higher. So in males, you don't really see a lot of breast cancer. It is possible. It is rare though. Um, and colon cancer, those are the big ones for um, females. So let's take a look at the hereditary nature of cancer. First of all, that you need to understand that cancer is normally not hereditary. And it's basically the consequence of random mutations through background exposure In our environment. That affects our body cells, not our germ cells. That is to say our eggs and sperm. So basically cancer is a disease of the body. And what happens is we have natural radiation in our environment and we're constantly absorbing that radiation. And that radiation is just randomly um, assaulting our DNA and the mutations we accumulate throughout life and we're accumulating them all the time are just basically, you know, we're just unlucky, right? So if you ask about the tumor suppressors, like for instance, we said you had to have two copies mutated. How do you get those two copies mutated? It's simple. You just are unluck you just unluckily accumulate them. Like for instance, normally that first copy will mutate maybe in the first two, three decades, if you're lucky, of life. And so a lot of us are walking around with one bad copy and one good. But it's okay because we only need one to be able to work for a tumor suppressor. It may take us another two, three decades to accumulate that second one, where then we start to see a cell that's now out of control of cell cycle. But at this particular point, we're probably within 40, 60, maybe even 70 years old. And so we don't get the accumulation of this until closer to the end of life, which is one of the reasons why cancer is oftentimes seen as a, a disease of the age. The longer you live, the greater your frequency or likelihood of getting cancer. Why? Because you're accumulating mutations. But remember, as you accumulate mutations, it's your body cells that are accumulating those, not your germ cells, not your eggs and your and um, your sperm. So if it doesn't affect your eggs and sperm, then it's not hereditary. That is to say that when you die of cancer, your cancer dies with you, unless you're carrying a mutation in one of these uh, cancer genes. And that's kind of where we get to heredity. So this is a small fraction of cancer cases, but the one that concerns us the most. Why? Because if you have a tumor suppressor gene and you're born already with one bad copy, then that means you're going to pick up that second copy a lot, young, a lot sooner in life than the average person. And so what we see is we see um, a what's called a predisposition to cancer, which basically um, causes cancer development in, at earlier stages.
mutations now, instead of accumulating your first mutation in the first 20 years of your life, you're accumulating the second mutation. And then that's, so you're starting that tumor progression sooner, decades sooner than the normal person. And so this is particularly what we're looking at for a lot of cancer, but especially for breast cancer, right? Because we have two different um, genes. We have BRCA1 and BRCA2. Both of them are involved in um, DNA repair mechanisms. So ultimately, um, you have to have both copies of either BRCA1 or BRCA2 um, before you increase your ability, right? Because the idea is the more you're born with, if you're inheriting these in your family, then it means you have a greater likelihood of getting both these copies because you only have, you're already halfway there. Whereas somebody who doesn't have this um, in, in their family is still has to go through the full life expectancy of exposure before they're going to get both of these. This is one of the reasons why um, in, they look at families and they look at not just your history, but they look at your family history. Like, do you have um, a history, a family history of breast cancer? Like, did your mom have it? Did your grandma have it? Do your aunts have it? And so if the answers to those questions are yes, then they're starting to suspect that there may already be a, an inherited form of a mutation in one of these two genes, making it more likely that you're going to develop breast cancer at an earlier age. And they want to get a hold of those people so that they can be aggressive about monitoring and making sure that they catch them quickly. So the first tumor suppressor that we found, however, was the retinoblastoma gene. And this is actually where we came and uh, discovered the idea of pre uh, predestination, of, um, of predisposition, okay? So the tumor suppressor gene, retinoblastoma RB, is basically um, an eye cancer. That's the cancer of the retina is what it is. And what we noticed is that basically young kids were going blind because of this. And what we uh, uh, found out was that and these kids who basically went blind at, or, at an early age, um, then what we had was a, a, a person who was basically born with already one bad copy or a predisposition. And so they had a much shorter trajectory to accumulate that second mutation in their good retinoblastoma copy. And because the eye is exposed to UV radiation, that mutation comes along very quickly. And then at a very young age, they um, get the mut second mutation, which then allows them to start developing retinoblastoma. Um, oftentimes it's in a single eye and they can treat it with removal of the eye so that that doesn't spread. Um, and that could sort of remove the cancer, but you'd be blind basically, obviously. And that was one of the first ones that we found. So like when you take a look at retinoblastoma, you first of all start off with one normal gene that you get from one of your parents, but genetically, you've also got a bad gene, a retinoblastoma mutation. So this basically creates your predisposition. So through life, then what happens is you accumulate that second mutation earlier in life. Um, normally, you'd accumulate that second mutation probably within the first couple of decades, maybe by the time you're 20 or 30, and then you're going to then you, then you'll have two mutations. And so now you have two mutated genes. You have the loss of your retinoblastoma. That's your tumor suppressor. And then you can start to form and develop retinoblastoma. And so that's kind of the basic pattern that we have with tumor suppressors. Now, in thyroid cancer, we notice that you have the RET gene, which is creates a predisposition for thyroid cancer. And this is one that can be passed from a parent to child. But RET, unlike the others, is not the tumor suppressor. It's actually a proto-oncogene. 
And so only one mutation is needed, it's dominant, to give you that predisposition. So ultimately, um, so you kind of basically sort of set it up. So this is basically not enough. So it's not enough to create cancer itself. But what it does is it permits and uh, kind of primes the pump, so to speak, for other mutations that you may accumulate later on in life. To be more effective in developing cancer. So for instance, this one, like for instance, if you had a healthy rat, then developing a mutation in some of these other thyroid genes would not have the same impact. But because you kind of already have RET mutated, then it leaves mutations in these other genes a little bit more risky. So it kind of sets the stage or primes a pump to make those uh, worse. And that's the reason why RET is considered a predisposition as opposed to a full out cancer. Now, how do we get exposure to these? Because I said that basically we have exposure. So that's basically where we get our carcinogens. So carcinogens can come in a couple of different ways. So a mutagen is pretty much anything that causes mutations. And a carcinogen is essentially a chemical usually that will cause cancer um, and it's mutagenic, right? So ultimately um, this will either create initiation, that is the destabilization of that first cell or initiation and promotion, right? Which is basically kind of advancing it. So it depends on what it is. So your heredity can predispose you to cancer um, but what you're exposed to in the environment will determine whether or not it gets any further than that. The other big one that we have is radiation. This can also cause mutations. For instance, in Colorado, we have a lot of radon gas in our soils. Um, and so that's our big thing, nuclear fuel, right? Those are plutonium fuel rods and x-rays are all types of radiation. Ultraviolet is probably the biggest one here in Colorado. This can cause mutations in our skin and cause skin cancer tobacco smoke right it basically is the worst thing on the face of the planet it's got tons of mutagens in it um, and it really increases your ability to get cancer so for instance um, a huge chunk of cancers are related to tobacco use so um, if you have smoking and alcohol involved then you really increase your cancer risk so passive smoking is also bad. This is secondhand smoke, right? So basically if somebody's smoking near you and you inhale somebody else's tobacco smoke, it's also bad. Um, and that's kind of where most of the no smoking laws um, are motivated by. It's not necessarily that we don't want a smoker to smoke. It's because when smokers smoke, the non-smokers are having to suck in that smoke too. And they're also in danger. Pollutants, basically metal pollutants, dust pollutants, chemicals, pesticides, all these will increase your risk of cancer. I think Roundup is just settled. Uh, a big complaint about um, their concert cancer causing structure, asbestos will cause cancer, radon, vinyl chloride, PVC, benzene, all these are basically potentially cancer causing things. Also, viruses uh, can cause it. For instance, hepatitis uh, can cause it, uh, human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer, Epstein Barr virus, uh, which can create nasal pharyngeal cancer. So, there's different viruses that can cause. Uh, cancer themselves. Uh, there's some retroviruses, um, leukemic viruses. So HTLV1, which is a human T cell lymphotropic virus. Um, this will cause a type of leukemia. Of course, HIV is a virus that can cause AIDS. And one of the big things that you see in AIDS, advanced AIDS, is Kaposi sarcoma, um, which is a type of cancer that almost no healthy individual will ever develop. Um, but because the um, AIDS patient has a completely crashed down immune system. Uh, they tend to get these opportunistic infections. Um, now, dietary choices, right? So uh, what you eat can have effects. For instance, if you have a high fat diet, um, obesity, um, things like that, these can cause breast and um, prostate cancer. So one of the reasons why we talk so much in uh, chapter nine about the meal plan and nutrition, right? Because basically fruits and vegetables, whole grains, no processed food, uh, 
get those chemicals out of your diet for the most part um, is what's recommended uh, for dietary purposes. Okay. Now let's take a look at diagnosis. All right. So basically when we take a look at diagnosis, you have seven warning signs associated. We refer to as caution associated for this. First of all, if you experience a change in your bowel or bladder habits, make a note of that. Um, if you have a sore that just has a hard time healing, make a note of that one. That's a pretty common sort of occurrence. If you have unusual bleeding or discharge uh, from anywhere, make a note of that, right? If you have a thickening or a lump of the breast or anywhere else for that matter, um, that usually is a signal of abnormal cell growth, a higher rate of cell growth in that particular area. That may be a problematic situation. So you want to make a note of that one. Um, indigestion or difficulty swallowing, right? This basically is meaning your digestive system is starting to function a little less efficiently. If uh, there's obvious change in warts or moles. So if you have warts or moles, keep close track of them. Always do a mole check on yourself. And make sure that your moles are not changing. If they are, it could mean that they are cancerous, that they're starting to break out of the rails. And if you have a constant cough or hoarseness um, all the time, um, then Make a note of that. So if you have basically um, these, then you should probably um, have a physical contact your doctor, express your concerns and have a thorough workup. But the main way of catching it early is by self-examination. It's being aware of what's going on in your body. Um, for instance, the ABCDE test to detect melanoma, um, the self-palpation for breast cancer, and testicular cancer to make sure there's no lumps in there. Um, the pap test for cervical cancer, basically, this is where you look at cervical cells to look for abnormalities like we started the chapter off with. Um, and so a good pap um, smear will actually is very effective in preventing cervical cancer. And so there's a high percentage, about 90% that are avoided because of that. So here's your ABCD test for um, melanoma. The first thing to look for is asymmetry. So basically... Um, generally speaking, um, if you have a mole that looks amorphous and roughly on the edges, that's typically not a good sign, right? Especially if the other half does not look like that, if it looks like it's a generally more well-behaved mole. The other one is border, right? So that scalloping structure, that's a very clear where cells are starting to evade and starting to move out into the tissue, the color as well. If it's got variation in color, typically moles are for the most part fairly uniform in color. But if you have multiple colors, especially these inky black colors, um, that's a signal. The diameter, um, basically if it's larger than six millimeters, uh, which is the tip of a pencil eraser, um, then you probably wanna have that checked out. And then if it's elevated, if it's raised above the skin um, or changing over time, then that's uh, another one. So if you have any of these, probably make an appointment with a dermatologist and do a mole check. And that's something that they oftentimes will do. So um, for colon cancer, um, there's three different things you can do for colon cancer. First of all, you can do a, a digital rectal examination. A sigmoid obviously basically use a thin pliable uh, lighted tube to kind of basically take a look at the interior lining of your colon. Um, you can do a blood test, a fecal occult blood test, basically, which just detects for blood um, in your feces. Um, and then um, you follow these up with a colonoscopy or an x-ray. And there's different versions of the colonoscopy too. For leukemia, basically, um, you can do a urinalysis to see if there's um, abnormal metabolites in there. For instance, if there's um, leukocytes, basically, they're getting into your urine system. You should be able to see that in your urine. Um, and for breast cancer, basically self-examination, and physical exam and mammography, right? So basically take a look to see if there's any lumps in the breast tissue itself. So for instance, you can see here is a mammogram where you can see a growth that's occurring in the breast tissue there, which hopefully you should be able to feel um, on self-palpation. So an MRI basically is a really uh, the go-to test for tumors and it's a soft tissue um, type of a test. So when you use an MRI, you're looking for soft tissues as opposed to x-rays, which means you're looking for um, hard tissues like bone. 
an ultrasound will basically take a look at tumors. Oftentimes you can see this on the stomach, pancreas, kidneys, and uterus. So this is kind of similar to an MRI, a little bit different. It uses actually sound waves, kind of like sonar, uh, to kind of bounce off the structures. And it actually goes pre create, create a very nice clear um, structure. And then of course, biopsies, where you basically remove some cells for examination, send them off to the pathologist, and then they can take a look for abnormalities and nuclei and things of that nature. And so this is just kind of like a little bit of a table just to kind of give you some vital statistics of some of the major types of cancers, their population, the test procedure, and the frequency that we see. So I'll let you guys take a look at that one. So one of the things we'd also do is the tumor marker test. Um, so this is basically looking for antigens or antibodies associated with a fight against tumors. So for instance, tumors were really substances, foreign substances, abnormal things. And this will pro provoke an immune response. So it'll provoke an immune response. And you can test for that. So basically, if you already have colon cancer, then it could be that your immune system is trying to fight against it. And it's because it's shedding different types of antigens um, into the system. So for instance, carcinoembryonic antigen is the CEA. That's basically um, one of the ones that they can test for to see if you have an uh, antibodies against that. That means your um, prostate is, is you're, you're fighting against it. And then the PSA, which is a prostate specific antigen, essentially is a test for a prostate cancer. So you essentially have a, prost a prostate antigen that's being released and your immune system will attack it. For ovarian cancer, it's alpha fetoprotein AP AFP test uh, for liver um uh, for liver tumors and CH125 tests for ovarian. So you have these different metabolites that these cancers start to shed that creates an immune response. And we can test for you, what your immune is, your immune system is reacting to, right? You can also have genetic tests to test for mutations in your proto-oncogenes and your tumor suppressor genes. This basically is a test for predisposition. To see whether or not you are already down one gene. Um, and so that's uh, one way to do it. So for instance, you can have a test for BRCA1, you know, which is a breast uh, cancer gene. And ultimately um, you can kind of be proactive. If you know you already have a predisposition for this, then you can already be proactive. Rather than waiting for development, you can go after and, and kind of do a preemptive um, type of a situation. Um, you can also use what's called microsatellites uh, to look for potential chromosomal damage that might lead to cancer. For instance, deletions in your chromosomes that could lead to bladder cancer. That's a common one. Um, and so these basically are areas of DNA that have either two, three, or four nucleotide repeats. So it's kind of like an AG, 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 or like an ACG, right? Or a CGG, 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 and it could be four. So it's just these repeat regions that can cause problems. And then the other thing you can also do because cancers like to um, regulate, they like to take telomerase for their own, is you can test for telomerase presence, right? Because the idea being um, that cancer cells are gonna make more telomerase than normal. And so if you have a really, really high telomerase hit, that suggests that cancer cells are busy at work using that telomerase to give them immortality. So let's go ahead and take a look at treatment. So typically treatment comes down to either surgery, remove the cancer, radiation, that's kill the cancer essentially, because radiation is cell toxic. Um, so is chemotherapy. So you use cell toxic things to basically deprive the cancer cells from being able to just do what they need to do. These are the standard standbys, so surgery essentially. Uh, you can't do surgery on blood cancers, but you can do what's called cancer in situ removal. This is basically in situ means in site. So this is like where you have a tumor and you can just cut it out. As long as you can get most of it and all of it, basically not most of it, you need to get all of it, um, then you should be fine. The problem with this one is you never know when some of your cancer cells have been left behind because remember it only takes one. So only one left behind is enough to create a new tumor. 
So generally speaking, you'll have surgery and then you'll either do radiation or chemotherapy just to make sure that any of the leftovers are killed off. So you're trying to basically stack everything in your favor. Radiation, basically use ionizing radiation. This basically, what this will do is it'll cause chromosomal breakage and cell cycle disruption. So it basically blows the cell up, essentially. So this affects rapidly dividing cells, that is cancer cells, which are already rapidly dividing, but it also um, will affect your own cells, your normal cells that are also rapidly dividing, like for instance, your skin cells and things like that. So it'll basically also affect other cells. And so, um, so we can kind of cut this down a little bit by administering it as a little beam or little seeds, basically of radioactivity that's implanted into the body. So you can target to pick particular areas and sort of um, affect, sort of keep normal tissue from being affected, but you will still get uh, weakness and fatigue, dry mouth, nausea, things like that. Basically the signs of radiation poisoning. Chemotherapy is a similar sort of a treatment to radiation, only you're treating the entire body, not just targeting it. So radiation is more targeted, um, chemotherapy is more global. And so this is also cell toxic. It also tends to go after rapidly dividing cells, which are mostly their cancer cells. And the idea is you're trying to kill those cancer cells, but basically um, when you kill the cells, you're just basically doing global damage to their DNA and disrupting their DNA synthesis. So they can't even complete cell cycle. So you put an all stop on cell cycle, but the problem is you also have normal rapidly dividing cells. So it also affects normal dividing cells as well. And so you have different types of drugs. It's a cocktail of different types of actions, cytotoxic actions, and they basically will attack cancer cells in a lot of different ways. And so what it does is it reduces um, that risk of cancer redu uh, producing um, a, a resistance to it. So the problem is this is uh, going to attack your cells too, which is the reason why chemotherapy is very, very debilitating and why you get very sick is because you're attacking your whole body and you're just hoping to take down the chemo, the cancer cells first. So in a chemotherapy cocktail, you'll find a lot of different types of things. For instance, you'll find alkylating agents, which basically will deep six DNA replication that essentially kills cell cycle. Uh, you also have anti-metabolites. Basically, these guys will block enzymes needed for growth, which is also G1. So it basically kills G1. You have anti-tumor antibiotics, for instance. Basically, uh, these are different than normal antibiotics. These basically will block cell division. Notice the common theme here. You're killing cell cycle. You're basically blowing up cell division. So nobody in your body is going to be able to do cell division including your healthy cells, which is the reason why you get so sick. Mitotic inhibitors, in this case, you're gonna inhibit mitosis. So if you escape one of them, you're gonna get nailed by another. And then the nitrosyureas would basically um, block DNA repair. So it just basically increases your DNA damage to a catastrophic amount. And so oftentimes um, you can also do what's called uh, bone marrow transplants. These will oftentimes be used in chemotherapy as well. So uh, the red bone marrow, remember, is making a lot of dividing cells, a lot of your white blood cells, your red blood cells. Um, so these are areas that are particularly susceptible to chemotherapy to grows because they are actively dividing. And so if you don't if you're not careful, you can create a very strong anemia type of a situation, which could kill you. Um, and so oftentimes we'll do what's called auto transplantation, where basically a stem uh, patient stem cells are stored 
before chemotherapy begins. So these are healthy, right? We're not talking about leukemia here. These are healthy stem cells. And then they're retained to the patient. You basically administer these back to the patients um, so that they can basically resume normal blood cell formation, right? Because you're going to knock all these cells out. And so you're going to reseed them with their stem cells so that you can kind of restore normalcy. There are some newer types of approaches, for instance, immunotherapy, where basically um, where your immune system can slow tumor growth. Um, but the problem is a lot of cancer cells will uh, create avoidance systems for the immune system. Um, the vaccines against cancer are under development um, and genetically engineered uh, types of things that can um, create um, and stimulate immune cells to attack the tumor itself, right? So this is kind of what it looks. So these are the immune therapies. So you essentially have the APCs, the energy presenting cells are removed from the patient. And then these are genetically engineered to have the genes for the tumor antigens, right? So they basically add the tumor antigen in there. Um, and then these APCs will display that tumor antigen on their surface, just like a normal immune system. And then these genetically engineered cells with now the tumor antigen on it are going to be implanted back into the patient where they are basically going through the normal presentation strategy to um, tell the immune system, look at this and attack, and then it'll attack the tumor suppressors. It's not unlike um, taking an attack dog, giving them the smell of a, of a target person and then telling them to go attack. So when they find that smell, then they go and attack them. Um, some antibodies can be used to bind to receptors of cancer cells. Um, but oftentimes these, uh, some of these will work and some of these won't. The problem is we don't know which ones will work or not. Um, we also use what's called P53 gene therapy. So basically we take um, expression of P53, which will trigger apoptosis. We know that. And so P53 is only selective for cancer cells. So it'll actually do this with cancer cells, not with individual cells. So it's an improvement over chemotherapy because it's not quite as global. And so what we do is we basically increase the P53 levels in a normal cell. Um, this doesn't do any harm, but the extra P53 will then basically restore that normal P53 function. And then it'll go and it'll kill those cancer cells, telling them to kill themselves. And so in some cases, this may work sufficient. We also have genome editing where we basically target specific DNA sequences for editing. So this is called CRISPR, right? The clustered regular, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. That's a mouthful. But this is a type of gene editing where you can essentially um, replace a bad gene with a good gene. And so this could reduce the size of tumors and it can sort of undo some of the mutations that you're accumulating in your cancer cells. Okay, so that is chapter 20.